We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are, are all united. united. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you today. As Australia's eSafety Commissioner, heading up the world's first online safety regulator, I'm really excited to share with you Australia's approach to regulating online harms. During a time when there's global recognition of the importance of online safety regulation um, and how that might be done to make sure that we're preserving freedoms of expression, um, but also allowing the innovation and technology to thrive. During the presentation, please feel free to send through any question in the chat function and my moderators, Julia and Ella, will collate questions and respond directly to you. There'll be time at the end of the presentation for questions. Next slide. It really wasn't all that long ago that the internet was still in its infancy and the world was still very much in an analog state. In fact, while computers have been networked in one form or another since the 1960s, many of the online threats and harms we're discussing today at the Internet Governance Forum didn't exist as little as three decades ago. It wasn't really until the 1990s when affordable personal computers met the 500, the 56K modem that the internet really took off. These game-changing devices finally brought the internet to the masses. Now, from my experience working in tech during the 1990s, it was a time of great promise. And it was also a time when any thought of taxation or regulation of this burgeoning industry was framed as an impediment to innovation and growth. Tech companies were moving fast and breaking things and wanted only one thing from government, to stay out of their way. And for many decades, governments all around the world were happy to oblige. But the internet we know now and we're preparing for then is vastly different to the one that we know now. Today's internet has brought humanity a myriad of benefits. The COVID-19 pandemic has seen the internet become an essential utility as the world turned to it to continue to work, learn, communicate, and be entertained. But along with the good, we also need to acknowledge the bad. Unfortunately, the internet has also become a highly enabling environment for many forms of abuse. There's the relentless online bullying of children, targeted misogyny, hatred, and racism the unchecked spread of disinformation and misinformation, terrorist weaponization of social media, and the most horrifying of all, the grooming, sexual exploitation, and abuse of children. I think there's no doubt we've really reached a tipping point and that governments around the world are starting to wake up to the fact that what's now playing out online is not only a threat to individual citizens, but potentially looms as an existential threat to democracy and civilized society. The US Capitol riots in January gave the world a small taste of just what this dystopian future could look like because rampant misinformation, polarization, and multiple vectors of abuse have become all too common a facet of both our own lives and our real lives. It can be easy to look at today's internet as a beast that's just too wild to tame. And sure, it can be difficult to know where to start. So why then is internet safety becoming such a popular idea and a growing focus amongst governments? I think there's a really practical reason for that. And it's really about the market's failure to self-regulate and to effectively address issues of user safety. Right now, the burden falls squarely on the shoulders of children and vulnerable communities. Right behind them are the children's often harried parents or the NGOs and advocacy communities seeking to protect their at-risk voices. 
They're at that top of the inverted pyramid, while big tech is currently at the bottom. We need to flip that pyramid so that the responsibility for user safety has big tech squarely at the top with governments nudging them along the way and with children and marginalized communities at the narrow end. And it's sad for me that the very companies that we were once seen as beacons of internet freedom mere decades ago are now seen as the facilitators of an unsafe internet and now actually serves to silence diverse voices. Frustratingly, we know that the tech behemoths have the smarts to be a major part of the solution to making the net safer and more inclusive. They certainly have the way. Many of them just don't have the will or frankly, the leadership to make the, sure the safety and well-being of their users a priority. While there is a burgeoning safety tech sector, there is no comprehensive solution coming from the market. So governments whose priority is to keep their citizens safe have had no option but to intervene. But we need to ensure that blunt force options that hinder the benefits of technology are not the go-to approach or that we create a splinter net of regulatory requirements across the globe. So Australia has been ahead of the pack in this regard. In 2015, the Australian government took a decisive first step in creating the world's first dedicated online safety agency, the eSafety Commissioner, with the sole purpose of protecting Australians from online harm. And earlier this year, our parliament recently passed the Online Safety Act, which not only strengthens our existing powers, but also provides e-safety with some new tools in our regulatory arsenal to help us better to protect more Australians online. Being a citizen-focused agency like ours from ground zero has not been easy. We have had to write the playbook as we've gone along. And, um, and we're seeking to fill in even more pages. In just six short years, we now believe that we've set up a successful, practical, and replicable model that focuses on three key pillars, protection, prevention, and proactive and systemic change. The first pillar, prevention, of course involves developing best practice resources and programs to prevent the online harms from happening to the first place. And our in-house research team is critical to building this evidence base. The second pillar is protection. And this covers the work of all our investigations divisions who run our many world first regulatory schemes. Through these schemes, we can provide Australians with direct support through the application of a range of civil powers to compel takedown of illegal or seriously harmful content, whether it's child sexual abuse material, pro-terrorist content, image-based abuse, or the non-consensual sharing of intimate images and videos, as well as the serious cyberbullying of an Australian child. The third pillar, proactive and systemic change, involves leveling the online playing field by encouraging tech firm, firms and platforms to take greater responsibility for user safety, putting the protections in upfront rather than retrofitting them after the damage has been done. And to us, this is about long-term cultural change that goes to the heart of our safety by design initiative so that companies are actually assessing their risks building it in and baking it in rather than bolting it on, but I'll discuss that more later. We also know that technology will always outpace policy, so proactive change to me means actively shaping the future by understanding tech trends and challenges, looking at the positive use cases, but also surfacing and mitigating the risks for citizens. There's no question that COVID-19 has affected all of our lives in profound ways. And this is also true for our online lives and the data we've collected in the last two years reinforces the need for agencies like ours to be available to citizens across the globe. And as more of us begin inhabiting the online world, fueled by fear, uncertainty, and doubt, online harms have become supercharged in ways that we weren't entirely prepared for. And in Australia, we saw spikes across all of our reporting areas at eSafety. During our 2020, our online content scheme received 21,000 public reports out of a population of 26 million, the majority of which involved child sexual exploitation material. This was the most in the scheme's 20 year history and a 90% increase compared to 2019. That was a surge from 11,000 to 21,000 reports. 
We also saw a 114% increase in reports of image-based abuse, um, which is not surprising given that people did turn to digital intimacy tools. But we also saw a range of sexual extortion scams that, that Australians were falling their prey to. And at one point we had a 600% increase in reports to our office. Now, serious cyberbullying of children also increased by 30%. And the number of Australian adults reporting online harassment to us through an informal scheme increased by nearly 40%. And sadly, these elevated levels of online abuse have shown no signs of abating in 2021. And we believe that what we're seeing now represents an alarming new normal. Now, these statistics are not unique to Australia and many other countries are beginning to recognize the damage that these online harms are causing to their citizens. But don't just take my word for it. Here are some of the voices of, of Australians we've helped. I was harassed online all through school. My ex used my phone to stalk me. We were mean to another player online. I wasn't sure if online classes were safe for my students. Someone shared a nude photo of me online. It made me feel exposed. Ashamed. Trapped. It made me feel angry. You are not alone. If you're online, eSafety can help. E-safety helped me respect others online. E-safety helped me learn to protect myself online. Helped me be a more confident teacher. Helped me get my picture removed. Well, it seems help me some... find the right support. It seems that sometimes buffering um, isn't perfect either. Um, but what does set Australia apart from other jurisdictions as, is that what we are doing to combat these numbers. This includes world leading new online safety reforms passed by the Australian government in July. The Online Safety Act, which comes into effect on the 23rd of January next year, will significantly bolster e-safety's protective powers. The strengthened laws will help more Australians who experience online harms and lift industry standards. The new laws will provide enhanced powers to significantly boost all protections for Australians. So our existing cyberbullying scheme will be expanded to provide protection to children being bullied on all online environments, not just social media. And this includes dating sites and online gaming platforms. The most significant change to the act, however, is to bring about a new world first adult cyber abuse scheme. And this will enable eSafety to require the removal of serious cyber abuse targeting a specific Australian adult where that material is intended to cause serious harm and is menacing, harassing and offensive in all cases. So we're trying to really balance freedom of expression in the period and, and uh, opinion on one side with that harmful targeted harassment that is really meant to cause harm and silence voices. We'll also strengthen our image-based abuse scheme by enabling us to rapidly and more expeditiously remove that content. So reducing the times that sites must respond from 48 hours to 24 hours. As it stands now, we have an 85% success rate in terms of getting these images and videos down from sites all over the globe. globe. So the act also carries significant fines for offenders and makes provision for hefty penalties for platforms who fail to remove seriously harmful content. So not only to penalize, but also to deter so that abuse like this cannot happen with total impunity. And I'm happy to answer more of your questions about the diverse tools as part of this act. But I wanna turn now to safety by design. Along with our new powers, there will be an underpinning regulatory regime that gives us a modern, effective set of graduated tools to un address online harms. But unless we're really addressing the fundamentals and the foundations of the internet in terms of making the platforms and the internet infrastructure we're all using safer, um, we're never going to regulate our way out of this. We're going to end up playing a game of whack-a-mole. So core to this 
is the world leading initiative to change the industry ethos, ethos for moving fast and breaking things to designing more mindfully. Um, it just makes good business sense. So we actually sat down with more than 180 organizations, companies, civil, civil society, and others to, to look at how we could come up with a set of principles that everyone could agree to. And those are, of course, underpinned by specific actions. And the idea, as I said before, is to help build safety into their products before they go to market, rather than retrofitting them after the damage has been done. So in 2018, uh, we came up with a set of three principles working out over nine months with about 80 organizations. But we know that principles are all, only as good as they're implemented. Otherwise, they're just principles. And we've also sensed a, a sense of principles fatigue. There are a lot of principles out there. So in speaking with some of the com companies, we decided to take that a uh, step further because we, while there are lots of privacy impact and security impact assessment tools out there, there was nothing in the safety space. So over an 18 month period, um, we developed, coded and weighted um, some two sets of interactive assessment tools, um, one for startups, which is very educative and takes about uh, an hour, but we also have one for mid-tier and enterprise um, companies. And, and these tools guide participants through a set of questions covering everything from leadership to internal policies to um, the best practice moderation and accountability measures, and then asking them about what systems, processes, and practices are in place. Um, it spits out a safety help check or an impact assessment, if you will. And we're pleased to say that companies from 32 countries have now accessed the tools and these health, health, health checks. And because they're educative, we don't want any company, particularly a startup, to be able to say, we just didn't know how our platforms would be weaponized or what the harms were. This lays it out all out for them, um, is totally free, and we've had an independent audit uh, by, by a privacy organization just to give uh, companies comfort that no information is being collected on the back end. The whole idea here is to lift safe, safety standards, um, and hopefully people will be able to um, better comply with, with laws and keep their users safer if they're actually utilizing these tools. Uh, just quickly, um, you might be wondering with all these new regulatory powers, how, when, and where we will choose to wield them. Now, building on and drawing from our experience over the past six years, I'm here to tell you that we will continue as we've always done by applying a harms-based lens and taking an outcomes-based approach to everything that we do. So where appropriate, we'll continue our collaborative approach with industry through the operation of our regulatory schemes. And to give you an example, 90% of the youth-based cyberbullying cases that we've settled in terms of removing content have been done co collaboratively without us having to issue a removal notice. So this collaboration is very important. Um, but at the same time, we won't hesitate to use these available powers at our disposal if, if companies aren't playing along and aren't, um, and aren't um, really um, tackling this harmful content and living up to the people, processes, and technologies that they're evangelizing. And so we'll continue to apply these in a fair, transparent, and proportionate way. Next slide, please. So many of you joining today are really in the same boat and are operating in a very complicated online environment. Sadly, today, the debate is often characterized by binary views of the need to uphold privacy and security or safety and protection. And it's vital that the technology industry and wider society start to reframe how we're viewing these most pressing online problems. It's my belief that we have to stop thinking of privacy, security, and safety as mutually exclusive. A healthy ecosystem relies on all three existing in a natural symbiosis. And I like to think of these as like three legs supporting a stool. Without each other, the stools will fall over. And all three legs need to be strong and work in tandem. In this case, to support an overall safer online environment. And yes, there is a natural tension between them, but a certain tension is healthy. People often talk about the absolute right to freedom of expression and freedom of speech. But what about when the speech 
does veer headlong into the realm of targeted abuse and online harassment. Shouldn't those on the receiving end have an equal right to exist free from online violence? In my experience at Twitter and elsewhere, absolute free speech often ends up taking away the free speech of others. And people are telling this that they actively self-center or leave technology. So they're driven offline by a, raw, a barrage of targeted online harassment and abuse that's continued unchecked, particularly that kind of abuse targeting women in diverse communities. And I believe that digital rights protectors also have a moral responsibility to broaden this discussion and take a more nuanced approach that at least gives equal billing to the rights of those who are most at risk online alongside the rights of freedom of speech and privacy. And that includes the dignity of children. Absolutism on either end of the spectrum is counterproductive. Governments, industry, and civil society need to find a way to balance and constantly recalibrate these fundamental sets of rights. Next slide, please. I'd like to leave you with some final thoughts on where to look next, because technological change will always outpace policy. And for us to be effective, it's imperative imperative that we all stay a step, step ahead, not only of tech trends and technologies, but also these new paradigm shifts, whether it's the metaverse or the decentralized web.3 point three world. At eSafety, we try to take a balanced and nuanced view to emerging technologies and trends, weighing up both the risks and the benefits of those innovations that could have for safety and well-being of the public, but also by providing a critical lens on how these could be used to abuse, harass, or harm individuals, and then pointing to solutions where they exist. We share these insights publicly with the aim of stimulating community debate on issues that might be on the periphery of our collective vision. When we developed our first Tech Trends Challenges brief on end-to-end -end encryption in February 2020 and in, in May, an insight into how artificial intelligence is being used to create deep fakes, we tried to issue the deep fakes brief to the general public. Um, nobody in media was interested. Now you can't pick up a technology reg and not be seeing something about algorithms, AI deep fakes, and, and indeed end-to-end -end encryption. And, and then those paradigm shifts you know, what could possibly go wrong um, in the metaverse when you pair haptic suits, teledildonics, AR and VR headsets together? We're, we're looking at immersive technologies as well. Our most recent brief is on decentralization and it outlines how we believe that we need to be looking critically at internet governance models and building in safety, security and privacy into the D-Web or Web 3.0 world. We can't totally have utopian colored glasses on. We need to learn from the lessons of the, of the past. And if there's no responsibility or accountability, then there may be no way to remediate or fix online harms. So we need to be actively thinking together about how we shape this future so that we make it the best online future that we can have. I wanna thank you so much for listening um, and to talking about our multi-layer approach to online protection. I look forward to taking your questions. Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner, for your presentation. We do have a question in the chat. Um, it says, as eSafety's responsibilities have been growing to encompass all of these new issues and responsibilities, I wondered if you have any lessons you've learned during this process that you would share with other regulators around the world? Right. Um, thank you, Rowena. That's a great question. Um, and. Um, I was in the UK last week at the Future Tech Forum meeting um, future regulators in this space. Um, I'm in Paris this week meeting with the likes of the OECD and um, going to Brussels tomorrow to have these precise discussions. Um, so I think they're, you know, they're going to, going to be interesting. They're going to, going to be different pro approaches being take, taken. And I believe one of the, the values that we provide is by providing these citizen-based complaint schemes so that we can actually remediate the harms of our citizens. But there are a number of countries who are looking at this and they're looking at what we call a processes and systems approach or a duty of care approach where, where they won't be um, providing individual complaint schemes, but kind of taking big enforcement actions around systemic weaknesses or challenges they seem. 
So on the one hand, I, I think you can play a constant game of whack-a-mole, but that, that work with the, our citizens at the coal face, I think gives us a rich trove of insights into how people are weaponizing technology, where the systematic failures are. So I think regulators who are looking at this big systems approach, you know, you can do, do a lot of stuff through, um, you know, open analytics and behavioral and, and the like, but not actually seeing how um, the platforms are being weaponized. That's valuable intelligence that, um, you know, they won't have at their disposal. At the same time, we can't keep playing a game of whack-a-mole and, and only just be remediating harms after they happen. So we are taking a much more systems and process based approach as well through something we call the basic online safety expectations, which will be um, a part of our legislation. It will also allow, allow us to compel transparency reports from the, from the companies, um, whether periodic or on specific wicked issues. And I think that transparency and accountability piece, which is also a facet of safety by design is, is really what's missing. And certainly what the whistleblower um, Francis Haugen has brought to, to um, everyone's attention, much more radical transparency than anyone expected. Does that, does that answer your question? Rowena has said, yes, thank you, Julie. Um, there's a comment from uh, Nigel, uh, which says, thank you to coming. Thanks for coming to the Future Tech Forum last week. Your work is really important. Our win legislation will benefit from the experience of others, which is uh, great to hear. Um, yeah, thank you, Nigel. That was a great opportunity. Um, and I, I thought DCMS did an incredible job of, of um, organizing that, particularly <laughs> uh, with Omicron and throwing them some prizes. Um, we've had some wonderful conversations with DCMS, but also with Dame Melanie Dawes, um, you know, the, the chair of Ofcom. And I think they, um, you know, by necessity, there's going to have to be uh, global co collaboration on, on all this. And while I think we all want to be on a similar trajectory, of course, governments are going to take slightly different um, approaches to all of this. We just need to make sure that, um, you know, that this regulation is workable and that companies um, can, can, can comply around the globe. I mean, the banking and financial um, you know, industry have been able to do it. Of course, they've been regulated um, for decades. And um, you know, I think if we even look back 50 years, um, when cars weren't embedded in seatbelts, um, the car manufacturers pushed back then. But now, of course, you don't expect to get into a car without a seatbelt, without anti-lock brakes or um, airbags that will deploy. Safety is built in by design, and that's actually be become um, a premium feature and something that companies compete over. And of course, it's dictated by international standards. So we may end up going there with the tech sector. Uh, I mean, you could apply consumer protection laws or even food safety standards. You're not, even if you're a small cafe, you're not allowed to poison people or make them sick. Um, so, you know, I, I think we have to take a different approach with um, startups and the like, but I, I don't think this has to be incompatible with innovation and technological growth um, as long as it's balanced and pragmatic. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, there are a couple of other comments uh, thanking you for your for the excellent and, and informative session. Uh, one other uh, question that's come through on a policy matter. Um, someone is interested to know about some of the safety risks associated with um, extended reality and immersive technologies that you mentioned. Um, and what are some of the key considerations we might need to think about um, in, in regulating this space? Uh, yeah, well, um, I, I think, um, of course, mindful privacy and safety by design um, is, is going to be really important uh, with immersive technologies. You know, I would welcome people to go to um, look at our tech trends and challenges briefs and this one particularly on immersive technologies at esafety.gov.au. Um, we take an interesting process. We, of course, um, look at research. Um, you know, wherever we can find it. And then we um, compare that with investigative data and it ends up being a, a cross disciplinary approach. And one of the things that we're concerned about, of course, is 
is the weaponization of image-based abuse and what we call um, rape by default. Um, and while I was trying to make a joke that probably wasn't very funny, <laughs> it is true that, I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, haptic suits will you have feelings and teledildonics and um, AR and VR, so hyper-realistic experiences. So if you can have a hyper-realistic, um, you know, pleasurable sexual experience, you can probably have a very frightening and awful um, experience of sexual assault at the same time. So it's sometimes it's it's hard to be able to predict or war game what the risks or the, the harms might be in the future. Um, I found in my um, 30 years in working in this area that human beings have tremendous creative potential for um, you know misusing and weaponizing technology um, that we might not even contemplate. But I think, um, again, I think the message here is let's actively shape the future rather than letting the future happen to us um, and then have to clean up the mess afterwards. Thanks, Commissioner. And we have one uh, final question uh, from the audience on site in Poland. Could I please hand over to uh, the IGF team for that question? Um. <clears throat> Um, thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, it was a very good presentation. And I have a question. Um, I myself am a female parliamentarian from Tanzania. And I like the fact that you expressed um, a lot of um, online abuse is being subjected to women, especially in developing areas. I wanted to find out what is your experience in, in, in making online a safe space for women parliamentarians in Australia? and for developing countries like Tanzania and others, you know, what could be done in partnership with your organization to ensure that we have more women politicians online because the continuous um, aggressive abuse that we endure, you know, leads to other women parliamentarians and other women politicians deciding not to be online and that contributes the, to the already huge um, digital gender divide and by not having us as legislators and policymakers online, it, it somewhat um, defeats the purpose of that connectivity and close engagement um, between ourselves and those that we lead in our respective areas. Thank you. A hundred percent. And um, first of all, thank you for your bravery. And I'm so sorry you've experienced this. I would say that that is a universal experience of women in any kind of spotlight, whether they're politicians, whether they're journalists, um, entertainers, or in sport. Um, and in fact, we'll be putting out some, some research uh, very shortly um, where we spoke to a range of professional women who said, and 35% of them said that they self-censor um, so, so that they won't cop online abuse. They think of it as just the cost of doing um, online business. I, I think what a lot of, um, men don't understand, frankly, is that the way that um, misogynistic targeted online harassment targeting women, it manifests differently. It's sexualized, it's violent. It talks about rape, appearance, um, even you know your supposed virtue or fertility um, in ways that men don't experience it. And it's meant to be menacing and harassing. And I, in fact, believe that it entrenches gender inequality. And that's precisely what it's designed to do. In fact, in the study that we're going to be releasing, 25% of women said they actually didn't take um, a promotion or a more senior leadership role because it would require them having an online presence and they just didn't want to deal with that. So um, we really need to tackle this. We'll be tackling this, of course, uh, through our online abuse scheme, um, but we also have some programs and some cyber abuse guidance. We have a program called Women in the Spotlight and it's social media self-defense training that we've been delivering to parliamentarians. I am really sorry, but I am going to have to, I have to run to catch a, a train to, to Brussels. Um, but um, Ella and um, Julia will remain on and can answer some questions, but I do uh, recommend you, you go to our website. You know, we are trying to really shape the future. And I might add that um, not, it's not only women that are disproportionately targeted, but of course those, with what we call intersectional factors. We know in Australia, if you're Abor Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, you identify as LGBTQI, or you have a disability, you're three times more likely to receive targeted online harassment. It has to stop. Um, you know, We know that humans are in the frame and the platforms just provide 
the amplification mechanisms, but if we allow that continue without, um, with total impunity, then we will normalize that behavior and um, we won't have the societal change that we really need to see. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Commissioner. It was great to hear from you today. Um, I think this session is due to finish now. Um, however, if people do have uh, follow-up questions, would like more information, please do not hesitate to get in touch with the team. Uh, the email address is international at esafety.gov.au. Thank you all so much for your attendance today, and we look forward to collaborating with you in the future. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the Internet Governance Forum. Thank you. We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united.